Man, that is awesome. Thank you, whoever went and helped out, because I know just looking at that, it's dangerous even to walk around there. <laughs> I'm so happy others went. Um, but man, that's it. We just want to come together to, to get out there and to share as family. We are truly a place to call home, and I hope that you take it serious. Call anytime. And my wife and Kaylee and Trace, we want to connect us because we think it's so important that we connect and we grow together to learn truth. We started a new series, Freedom, Break Every Chain. And last week, Garrett started with that, breaking that chain of culture. And man, the culture can get crazy fast. And he shared that our identity has to be in Christ. See, when our identity is in Christ, now we understand the truth and what culture should be. And we have that connection. And today we're going to go on in another topic. I know he stressed that it's going to be tough topics, but we should want to hear truth and we should want to grow in that truth. So today we're going to talk about breaking that chain of hate. Again, hate is, can be rampant. I want to share a story. My wife and I took one of our kids and a friend to California for a vacation and as we cross the border of Arizona to get into California, we get the Taco Bell for lunch. And I go up there and I buy lunch for the two kids and my wife. And I sit down, I go, whoa, senior discount. That's pretty cool. Because I do qualify some places. So I go, let me see what Taco Bell's is. And Taco Bell's senior discount is 65 and up. So hate started to build up in me. Because I'll take 55, that's what I am. I'll take 58, maybe. But 65, I sat down and said, honey, do I look 65? She said, I'm not going to answer that. No. But I did then, people know me, the frugalness in me said, well, I just saved 10%. I don't care anymore. So again, it's a joke because we are going to talk about hate and how hate can really drive us and how hate leads us to not do things that we know we should do. And see, it builds us and it builds up in us and we start to do things that are unthinkable. Things that we would never picture ourselves doing, but hate has come in, and now it leads us. And man, it sets in, and it can control us. And that's such an evil place to be and a bad place to be. See, we have to break that chain of hate. I want to start in Galatians. And it's so important we understand as we see what freedom truly means as a Christian. It says in Galatians chapter 5, starting in verse 13, for you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. See, your freedom can't be excused to do sin, to live the way you want to. You have to understand that there's a freedom that God has given us when our identity is in Christ. And we're Christian, we're Christ-like. And that's not going to be everyone. We hope and pray that it's everyone. But see, it's not going to be. So we have to keep growing and learning to be like Christ. And then there's freedom. And it's amazing. He says, instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. But if you are always biting and devouring one another, watch out, beware, destroy, beware of destroying one another. I want you to know, that was written to the church. See, that's the problem. We have church that should be united, but we have churches that teach their own truth because they're afraid to step into teaching truth because it might offend. And our purpose and our goal and our desire is to come together as the church and make a difference. That's why Paul thought it so important to reach out to the church first. See, we love our neighbor. 
as ourselves. But if we can't even love people that believe in Jesus because we let those little differences get in and we argue, we knit pick and we start biting and, and gnashing of teeth to each other. Like you said, you start devouring, watch out. We're going to destroy a church and the world's going to get worse and worse and worse. See, when we as believers have differences with basic biblical truth, then hate starts to build up. And we start to forget the unity that God desire us, desires us to have. See, he calls us to be unified in Christ. See, when we're focused on Christ and we're doing our life for Christ, see, those biblical things are the same for every Christian or should be the same for every Christian out there. Now, there's things that aren't essential, but man, there is essential biblical truth that this Bible, which is 100% for us, accurate in God's word to teach us what's right and wrong, that are in there that every single Christian should unify with. And that's truly marriage between a man and a woman. He explains it. That's truly gender. He created them male and female. See, these are the things that we unify in so hate doesn't build up in the church. See, as believers, there should be no difference in those biblical things. Now we have different denominations that have their little plugs here and there, which is fine for them. It has nothing to do with salvation, but the biblical things that matter do. So we stand firm and we grow. And that's why Paul's writing to the church, warning them, do not let this spiritual stuff be a problem. Don't let this evil come in. See, we are the body of Christ. He is the head. We are all important in that we all are needed to do this right, to to walk along and we need the hands and we need the eyes and the nose and everything that we are gifted and we need as Christ leads us. See, when hate is present, it is damaging to people. See, and we keep, it keeps us from seeing right from wrong sometimes. And it's a scary thing because again, you start acting in ways that are unthinkable that you would never have thought you would act. Look what Paul continues on in Galatians 5 and verse 16. He says, so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. See how important it is that he's talking to the church? See, when you let your spirit in you, if you believe in Jesus and you accepted him, you have the Holy Spirit in you. Let him lead you, and you won't be thinking of the sin that your flesh wants to do. That's so important. If we can't start there, then we're always going to struggle everywhere else. He says, the sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. Again, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you're here, we're so grateful. See, he loves everyone. We want you to join us. Come and talk to us. Let's accept Christ and let's walk together to keep growing and learning, but it is, as a Christian, it has to be Christ-like that is your effort and your trying to do and trying to resemble him, not the world. It goes on, these two forces are constantly fighting, so you are not free. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation of the law of Moses. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. See, when we follow our sinful nature and we follow our flesh, see, we follow what the world says love is, feelings. Our truth is okay. If you believe it, you can do it. 
and it's okay. See, we start letting these things happen. He says it's very clear what the results are. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, and wild parties, and other sins like these. See, it's huge because we're all going to struggle with something else. We're not going to struggle with the same stuff, the same sins. We're going to have other things. So look at selfish ambition is bad. See, when you're trying to get ahead just for you, that's opposite of what God wants us to do. He wants us to know him for our salvation and then share for others. See, selfish ambition will never be a part of what God wants. See, drunkenness, wild parties. See, you're letting go of your control and you're just doing what you want to do and you're saying, I'm a good person, I'm okay. And anger and look at dissension, division, envy, all this stuff can bottle up. I know it seems like, oh, the church just focuses on the sexually immoral and the lustful pleasures, but that is dangerous. They're all dangerous for us because look what Paul finishes with. Let me tell you again, Galatian, the church of Galatia, he went there and taught the good news about Jesus. And then as he went on, he wanted to go back to strengthen the believers. See, that's what's so important. See, church is for us to be strengthened, to be able to understand who God is, to make sure we're getting it right because we're all going to struggle. But he goes, let me tell you again, church, as I did before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. See, if you choose to live for you, no matter what it is, and we see that huge range of things, you're not worthy of the kingdom because the kingdom is free because of Jesus. All we got to do is surrender and let go of us. That's the coolest part because we're the biggest problem. That's why Jesus was sent. And if we can just let go and let God and keep learning, he knows we're not going to do it perfectly. We're going to have to keep learning and we're going to make mistakes. And man, that's the cool part. He sent Jesus grace when we weren't worthy. We get something that is so amazing, eternal life. And then he showers us with mercy because we're human and he knows it. And he just wants us to need him and go back to him and repent and keep that going. That's why it's so important that our identity is in Christ. And we can grow and learn to be different. And now we can truly love our neighbor as ourselves. And we can keep growing and keep learning and keep seeing, but keep sharing truth. Because no matter how you cut it, if you don't share biblical truth, which is Jesus says he's the way, the truth, and the life, no one gets to heaven except through him. See, he's not the way, the love, the life. See, love is obedience. That's what he says. If you love me, you would obey me. I'm giving you this example. So when you're in me and your identity is in me, you'll do the things that you know are right. And the more you study this, the more you know when you have to teach truth and share truth and love truth, and it keeps you moving. Look at Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. says, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. See, that's the only way is when we start living truth, again, mainly in the body of Christ, and we start shining a light that makes a difference and we all come in the unity about that truth and that light. And now we, that light starts 
permeating into the world and see when light goes in, darkness flees. See, when you let darkness, darkness stay around, it gets darker and darker and darker. And he shares that in the word. If the light you think you have is actually darkness, how dark is it? So when you let all this evil in the world continue to go because, well, I, I can't talk about it at church. Then it gets darker and darker. And every year, something else gets darker and darker. And now we're so confused because we have opened the door for truth to be anything people want it to be. And we've lost this country, which was started on biblical principles. They said, we cannot survive as a nation without God. Now we open it up to where there won't be one religion that controls it, but everyone is under agreement when they wrote it that these biblical principles that line up with God and Christianity are the ones we need for moral integrity. And no one has a problem with it until the world starts pushing and changing and moving that line to make it harder and harder. And we have to understand that we keep pushing truth we keep living truth and love. And again, you do not love somebody if you let them purposely live outside of truth that Bible is talking about. See, we don't try to make people like us. We try to show them how much God loves them. See, God loves everyone. He has no favorites. He loves the person that decides free will to go to hell. He loves them. He's not going to make them go to heaven. He wants true people that want to surrender and say, I need you. That's it. But he doesn't love and hate people. He loves. He is love. He cannot not love. But again, he doesn't make it different for you. If you choose your path, he's going to let you have your path. Keep learning. We talked about it. That was to the church. And I want to read in Luke it's not going to be up there, but in Luke 6.35, it says, love your enemies, do good to them, lend to them without expecting to be repaid. Then your reward from heaven will be very great, and you will truly be acting as children of the Most High, for he is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. See, God shines the same sun on everyone. So he's not telling us to just let people do whatever, love them, share with them, and be there for them. That's a whole difference than the world saying, oh, Christians are just mean, and they say that marriage is this only, and that's just wrong. I can do whatever I want. If we don't share and love and care, there's never going to be a, a thought to decide to be lined up with God, which, again, if you're not in Christ, your eternity is not with the Father in heaven. See, hate is connected to anger. And when it's poured out, again, we do crazy things. Look at right from the beginning. Cain kills Abel, his brother. Why? He's a little bit angry because he did something that was right. And his Giving to the Lord wasn't his first fruits he gave and just gave reluctantly. And all of a sudden, he anger fits in because God says, man, I accepted Abel's offering, but yours I do not. He gets mad and see hate builds in and he kills his brother. See, Saul chases David for years. All David ever did is support King Saul. And he just got envious See, that envy set in. He started hating him because they were saying, oh, Saul kills the thousands, David kills the 10,000. And all of a sudden, pride comes in and he starts to hate him. He tries to kill him over and over and over. And David has chances to kill him and he doesn't. Again, I don't know why. That would be normal to me thinking. But he's like, no, he's God's chosen. God will move him out when he needs to. And he will bless me for being honest. But see, Saul was lost in the hate. 
Esau hates his brother Jacob enough to where Jacob has to leave the whole area and go live with relatives. See, when we see what hate does with the tension all over this world and in this country, we should be disgusted. I was just in Israel. There is so much hate. They're bombing today or yesterday. They're still bombing and fighting. And it's coming here because we have so much hate. Half the country is split on hate. So much hate, we cannot even think of what is right anymore because we'll vote for what is wrong just because we hate the what is right because, again, we're caught in a system that is proven to be garbage. So I call out to Christians, start following Christ fully in your voting, in your life, what you do, and line up your life with this, and God will honor you. Don't get caught up in, oh, I'm this, and I'm going to stick to it even if I think it's wrong because I can't say I'm wrong, and I can't ever show that I can go the other way. See how scary it is when hate comes in? We'll do things even when we know they're wrong. It's biblical. I think it's in James. If you don't do what you know you ought to do, it's a sin. See, if you vote for a specific party just because, even though when you know they don't line up, it's wrong, you know you're doing something wrong, don't do it. Both ways. I'm not calling anything out specifically. I'm calling out, vote this way. You're a Christian. That's the only way you can vote. If you truly believe it, and you truly want to live, and you truly want to grow, because once it gets in there, we have to believe that we're one nation under God. See, we're in God we trust. So as soon as it comes out of there, then we are not, and people start getting angry. I always laugh when people say how bad America is. I think it should be an easy thing if you hate America, go live in a third world country for a year and then come back and see how it changes. Because anyone that was truly living in a garbage country that is dictator led and led that way and came here loves this country. How weird. But we're, again, we let hate come in. We let our own feelings come in, and now we hate this country that everyone else wants to be in. In God we trust. If we trusted God, this country would run smoothly. It wouldn't be perfect because there's going to be trials. There's going to be tribulations, but we would act in love with those trials and tribulations and continue to grow. See, this means you are choosing to live your way and the truth doesn't matter to you. See, when truth doesn't matter, we get whatever we get. We start getting things that people want instead of what God has said. Our feelings will keep us struggling and we'll miss out on the chains, the chain we need to break in this world, see the freedom we have when we let go of culture, we let go of hate, we let go of addictions, which is next week, we let go of idolatry, which is the week after, and we break those chains, and we start living free, living for God, and man, again, there's a power that is in us that is stronger than the power that's in the world. See, we deliberately choose the world instead of the spirit. And we look just like the world. Why is marriage, divorce, the same in Christians as it is in the world? Because we want to look like the world. And if the world can do it, we can do it. 
and we lose our integrity and our character and our passion to follow Christ is let go and we start living any way we want. See, hate begins in the heart and Jesus felt it from this world. He lived 33 years. That's it. And did nothing but good. And they hated him so much they killed him. It's crazy. Look at what he went through. And he shares, despite being hated, he shared and warned the teachers of religious law. See, the people that were doing this and guiding people wrongly, he warns them. Look at Matthew 23. I'm going to go through a few. In the verse 11, it says, the greatest among you must be a servant. That's Jesus. See, we have to serve others and enjoy it because we're doing what God has called us to do. He says, but those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. What sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in the people's faces. You won't get in yourself and you don't let others enter either. What sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cross land and sea to make one convert, and then you turn that person into twice the child of hell that you yourself are. See, it's not about looking right or sounding right. They were sounding right and looking right. They weren't living right. See, a lot of Christians talk a great game. They'll share, but they won't do. It's sad. It's in the pulpit, too. They know truth. They know it'll set us free, yet they don't want to stop their checkbooks from coming in because they got to make money to pay for things. And it is important. We're non-denominational. We get no funding except from you guys. We have 12 air conditioning units. We had six go out at once. Luckily, it was COVID. We didn't have people here. But would you sit in here at 120 with no air conditioning? I hope, but I'd be sweating like crazy. I'm Italian. I sweat eating. So again, we need finances. We have things to do so we can grow together. But we're not going to ever dodge truth to keep you happy worldly. So we're going to teach truth. And that's one of our big four, giving. See, it's coming, it's serving, it's getting in groups so we can grow together, and it's giving. That's our membership here. And man, we're giving God what's his anyways. We don't pass buckets, we don't talk about it, because I want you to get it, and God will give you everything you ask for. If you have a question about something and you're truly seeking it, you'll truly find it. It's living right, not just talking about it. Look what he goes on to say. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law, and you Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you so carefully clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are filthy, full of greed and selfish indulgence. You blind Pharisees, first wash the inside of the cup and the dish, and then the outside will become clean too. What sorrow awaits you, teachers, religious law, and you Pharisees, hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, but filled on the inside with dead people's bones and all sorts of impurity. Outwardly, you look like righteous people, but inwardly, your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. That was Jesus, but he's so peaceful and loving. He would just go and eat with the sinners and hang out with them and give them a high five for being sinners. See, that's what the church wants you to believe. He's sharing this. And nine times in that section, he has that woe to the Pharisees and that truth. And he didn't do it to shame them. He did it to show if you let hate come in. See, they hated him for no reason. If you let that hate come in, now you're going to do things that should never be done. See, if you don't start living his truth, hate settles in. Right now, this world is full of hate. 
This is the opposite how we should be acting as Christians. See, hate is blinding and it takes away any reasoning. So there's a wall put up and their first thought is to fight back. Jesus didn't fight back. He shared. Paul didn't fight back. He honored God wherever he was. The world put him in jail. He shared about Jesus. The world beat him and whipped him and threw him out, thought he was dead. He shared about Jesus. When the world tells you you're mean for believing the truth, just love them. See, you don't have to fight and argue with non-believers. Walk away, wipe the dust off, and keep praying for them and keep shining a light. Make the light you shine on them, drive them crazy enough to ask you, okay, I'm tired of it. What about this Jesus? And we get to. See, hate that is allowed to grow becomes harder and harder to get rid of. And it's dangerous for our heart. It makes us blind and we can't be the best that God wants us to be because pride sets in and it takes over and we can't admit we're wrong anymore. We can't admit we're wrong. You'll say what's wrong, but then you won't change because of the hate you have. So you'd rather just keep living in wrong because it's better than admitting that you're wrong. We just don't like to do that. See, when we call ourselves Christians, we are the church, and our standard becomes what Jesus did, how he lived, how he shared, how he cared, how he loved. See, the religious leaders couldn't let go of hate. Think about it. They killed him for doing good, doing miracles, healing the sick, giving sight to the blind, helping the lame, healing the lepers, raising dead people. And they killed him. How dare he? But hate weighs us down. Things that can activate hate. Again, at this church, I think it's so important that we understand the things that cause things, and we know, so we went through, we know our enemy. We want to know who Satan is and his, his actions and his things, but we want to know the other side as well, so we are aware and we're able to see. And then, we're such good students of the word here, we know this, so we know what's right. That's why we read it, or we ask you to read it every day. That's why we don't want you to read it to check off a box. We want you to read it to ask, so I can change. So I read it for transformation, not information. And I read it to apply the knowledge, so I can live differently. And man, I'm going to mess up. I've learned just to confess to my wife when I'm wrong. And two times a year, I'm wrong. And she least to get to have that excitement. But we have to know what it is. And number one, it's conflict. Conflict. When we don't agree, we start to find ways we can win. You ever been there? Do you ever have to win a fight so bad with your wife that you win and you're like, yeah! And then the whole rest of the week or day is crap? Did winning really help you? But see, once there's conflict and you have to win, now your mind goes off to what's good or better, and we go right into that. Look at Proverbs 13.10. Pride leads to conflict. Those who take advice are wise. Let that sink in. You don't have to be right just to be right. See, Warren Worsby mentions this. How wonderful and pleasant it is when brothers live together in harmony. The wicked, prideful person destroys unity by sowing seeds that produce a bitter and divisive harvest. Some of these seeds are pride, gossip, anger, and hatred. 
and a quarrelsome spirit and foolish questions. See, when that anger and that evil in the world starts taking in and that hate starts going, there's conflict, all these other things start to go and come in. and We don't notice it anymore. Be aware, understand, see when there's problem, how you can dissolve it by asking God. Number two, envy. See, when we want something someone has, hate can build up and we fight and cheat and steal to get it. When we can't get it, hate shows his ugly head. And we bring it to another level. See, be careful what you are envying in your life. The slippery slope. Celebrate what people have. Don't envy. Thank God for what you have. And keep being obedient and saying, God, here I am, use me and see what he does. And be, again, satisfied because our home is in heaven, not here. This is our temporary skip through. We get to go through here to be an example. Number three, loss. See, when we experience loss, hate can creep in as well. When we lose something to somebody, our first reaction tends to be hate. can't let that trip us up. We can't let this control us. See, in everything we do as Christians, we should be checking them to the word of God. Everything. Well, that takes some time. Really? It's not worth getting it done right and showing love right because it might take you five minutes? Darn it. Some people wait in that Starbucks line at the drive through 10 minutes. It's just perspective. When we line up with the word of God, it will be better for us. It won't take away all the problems, but see, it'll make us be able to get through them and then be a light to someone else so we can be an example of how God used us even in this hard time. See, our testimony matters so much because your struggle that you got through with God is going to help someone that's struggling. We have to understand that. Colossians 3, verse 2 and 4 says, Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. And when Christ, who is your life, I'm a Christian. Oh, weird. Christ is my life. Or don't use the term. Don't desire it. But once you desire it, now Christ is your life. Man, when he's revealed, you're going to celebrate and enjoy everything that he does. There are more. We can keep going on this. But that's enough. But be aware of the things that start the hate in you and me because it's different for all of us. See, hate is dangerous because it is damaging to others and us. And it is a motivator for wicked behavior. Understanding God and his love is the only way back when hate has a hold of our heart. Keep fighting. Keep praying. Keep growing. Keep coming to church to learn and say, I open myself to learn and I'm going to believe the word of God over anything this world says. See, we need to break the chain of hate and be free. It starts with accepting Jesus and surrendering our will and being obedient to God. See, when we take the hurt out, the conflict out, the envy out, the loss out, we can start that chain of breaking the elements that are struggling, making a struggle, and it opens up that thing we all need to remember and we need to do, and that's forgiveness. See, we don't hold a grudge, we forgive. 
We don't hold hate, we forgive. We don't hold on to loss, we forgive. And we start growing. See, Matthew 18, 21, 22 says, Then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? No, not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. So you don't make it seem like it's just whatever. Forgive, ask God. God, I'm having a hard time forgiving this person for what he's done, and I can feel my, myself boiling up. Help me. and He will help you. See, when we do that, we will be able to loosen the grip of hate. and We'll start living in that freedom that he wants us to live, live in. Look at Luke 6.27. It says, but, you, but to you who are willing to listen, I say love your enemies. That's what we just read earlier. I wanted to share that again. Because love your enemies. It doesn't say you have to agree with your enemies, but love them. Show them that you're there to care. Warren Worsby shares, Jesus assumed that anybody who lived for eternal values would get into trouble with the world's crowd. Christians are the salt of the earth and the light of the world, and sometimes salt stings, and light exposes sin. See, if we're called to be salt and light, we're going to sting when people don't think they're sinning. See, and that light exposes it. But it doesn't mean you can't, you're not supposed to be salt and light. That's what we're called to be. Truth and love. If you don't want to hear truth, you can't be free. Because your freedom will never line up with his. See, it's not hate to teach truth. It's actual love. So keep learning and equipping people to be salt and light because it shows that you care about their eternal salvation. And I want to end with this quote. It's so important because I think we get this misrepresentation of Jesus sometimes. Jesus didn't eat with sinners and tax collectors because he wanted to appear inclusive, tolerant, and accepting. He ate with them to call them to repentance. Every single time he told them to go sin no more, the cool part about it was they were already wondering and seeking his truth. They were tax collectors. They were struggling. They were prostitutes, but he always taught them to sin no more. He didn't just hang out. And if I hang out with Johnny for a week, getting drunk with him and being, it's so cool, and then maybe I'll throw in the truth later. No, he always had a purpose. When he did it, he did it because he knew they were already moving in their mind to seek something else that they needed, and they needed Jesus, and he knew it, and he shared with them repent, sin no more. Let's pray. Dear God, we come to you. We ask you to open our hearts, release any hate that's built up. It's so easy to get caught up in that. We want it to be gone. Fill our hearts with the spirit fully and give us the strength to follow fully, to let go of ourselves, to die to self, pick up our cross and keep charging forward. We are the church and we're so grateful that we get to be, keep us growing and learning and help us know that you love us so much that you did this all for us so we can be home with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you.